Hey there, learners. Welcome back. Let's pick up right where we left off, episode four of five on human origins. Remember that future documentary, Waterworld? I used to love it. I don't know how I feel about it now. Global warming melted the ice caps. The world was flooded, just like in native lore. But a man named Kevin, a mutant, had gills behind his ears and could survive underwater, which was really beneficial in a land covered with water, you know, water, a water world, if you will. So looking at her genes, experts can read a lot. We actually have a very low amount of genetic diversity. Literally every human on the planet is very similar genetically. And the explanation of that is pretty simple. Between 70,000 and 140,000 years ago, there was a very small breeding population. We touched on this earlier. Something happened. There was a population crash. We might have only had a few thousand individuals left. Maybe as many, as many as in the 20,000s, but maybe only several hundred actual breeding pairs under the threshold for the endangered species. Homo sapiens, humans, us, endangered, maybe almost going extinct. Depending on how we handle the coming decades, mutants like Kevin could be our future. Let's kick into it. Hello everyone, I am Trace. Thanks for tuning into my channel. Please consider joining the Nerd Fam. It's just, you know, all of us here learning together. Just click that subscribe button. Evolution is a long process. Millions of mutations, billions of individuals, lots of trial and error, mainly error. And in this case, error means, you know, dead people. Trillions of strands of DNA with little switches that are flipped on or off. Everything affects everything. Evolution is not some far off concept affecting only moths and a few disparate species. Evolution is happening constantly and rapidly, and it lines up with the waves of geologic time. A hundred million years ago, the tropics stretched from Alaska to Antarctica, and then everything cooled. 55 million years ago, it was hot again. Temperatures rose by six degrees Celsius in 20,000 years because of massive methane release, and then it cooled. A report by NASA from 2012 says that 20 million years ago, Antarctica had trees, then it cooled. We're on a cycle of boom and bust, just like with economics, you know, without controls, which is why we used to have some. Based on the study of fossil evidence corroborated by ice cores from Antarctica, the boom of heat that we are getting now is so much faster than it should be. It's affecting you, it's affecting me, it's affecting animals and plants and every living thing that evolves on this planet, which is every living thing on this planet. Let me give you an example. Birds migrate for the winter. They do this in Europe, just as they do it everywhere. And in the spring, the sand marten flies from Western Africa to the United Kingdom. Barn swallows also fly then from the United Kingdom to South Africa. And that's almost 5,000 miles, 10,000 kilometers. The sand marten used to actually arrive later in the season, but now it arrives first. That might seem minor, but staying in Africa longer and arriving in the UK later impacts so many things. You're like, ah, oh, it's just one bird, whatever. It's just changed because birds, birds don't have conscious thought. They don't think, oh, maybe I'll just hang out a little while longer. I don't got nowhere to be. They do things based on instinct and based on what they know that they've evolved to do for survival. So if they arrive in the UK later and they stay in Africa longer, that impacts the available food in both places, whether for predators of the sand marten or the sand marten that is eating food in Africa longer into the season. What if another bird eats a lot more before the swallows arrive? What if the population size grew or shrunk? What if martens leaving Africa earlier increases the number of predators in the UK? Because now there are so many more martens to eat and those martens are making more predators. It changes how everything that interacts with those species live. And in humans, this can be seen as well. For example, high stress is passed down to children. 
It's not in your DNA, it's in your epigenetics. Epigenetics is sort of like the metadata around your DNA. Little chemical switches that get flipped on and off depending on what's going on in your actual DNA, and it turns out that that can be passed down and affect your offspring. Things like starvation and famine, huge amounts of strife that is seen in survivors of things like the Nazi Holocaust, have been seen in the genetic record, the epigenetics of those human beings. It alters our genetic code, and then that can be passed down again and again and again. Climate change is a huge source of stress, could cause famine, could cause starvation, and that ongoing stress can cause human adaptation. So how do we know that global warming will affect our future? All we got to do is turn around and look at the past because that is how it works. Weather is temporary. Climate is for a long time. <laughs> Rick Potts from the Smithsonian's Human Origin Project looked at ancient climate shifts and he learned a lot about paleoanthropology. Would have thought that a, um, you know, a bipedal ape-like creature emerging in Africa six million years ago would end up having such an, an amazing effect uh, all over the planet and even in the atmosphere and in the ocean. That's an amazing uh, venture to consider. But as a result of our ability to survive environmental change, our survival strategy, our main survival strategy is to change our own immediate surroundings. Climate instability affected human evolution. It did it already, so why wouldn't it do it again? What we've learned already is that adaptation is not one person adapting. It is not Kevin. Adaptation is all of us changing. We have all changed to make the environment more suitable for us or make us more suitable for the environment. And when it comes to human history, mostly we've done the former. We change our surroundings to make them more suitable for us. It's one of the reasons that we have been so successful on this planet. So for example, first, uh, an ancient human, not Homo sapiens, probably before that, built fire. So all of those cartoons where they're like, oh, help build fire. You know, that that's that it was some not human who did that. So we're just taking the credit. When we built fire, we changed the brush patterns in those parts of the forest. We changed how forests worked. And we needed clothing, of course, because then we would move into different regions of the planet where it was cold. So we started making clothing from animal parts, which means we needed tools and we needed to hunt more animals. And we used the stones and bones from those animals and regions to make those tools and build those shelters. And we started Started to change our local environment. And all of those things make sense at the time in which they occurred of uh, being able to ride out the storm of uh, the dearth of resources or, or keeping warm um, during, uh, during a cold time. But it became a way of life so successful that it spread all around the world. And that right there, taking that ability to modify your immediate surroundings, that becomes global change. <laughs> And while this is not a genetic change, it's not a genetic adaptation, I argue, fellow human learner, that this is very similar to an adaptation. But instead of our genes changing, we are passing down an adaptation through cumulative culture, almost like a meta-metadata from our epigenetics to this other thing. And the difference is our bodies don't actually change, but how our brains work does change. And when there are just a few thousand people changing the environment to suit us, that's no big deal. It's no big deal, right? We're just changing this one forest in this one place and, and that's fine. We picked up some of the stones and it's fine. And, but now we're 8 billion people changing the earth to make it better for us. This is not a local change. This is a global change. For every advantage that occurs, there are costs whether it's in our biological evolution or in our cultural uh, evolution. And we're seeing those costs now. And so what we're doing in terms of the rapidity of changing the environment really outpaces anything that we see back in the past. We do not know how this is going to change us. But of course, you wouldn't be here if I didn't want to speculate. So if we base this on past changes, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, for example, over millions of years using ice cores, think of like an apple or a pineapple, you know, you get in there and you pull it all out and you have this whole record of everything that's happened in the atmosphere over that time. You can see volcanic eruptions. You can see how the atmosphere, based on the bubbles in the ice, you can see what the atmosphere is made of. And when we compare that to the fossil record, which would be a completely independent record, so we're comparing two primary sources and the ice cores and the fossil records line up and we find that we evolved during an unstable environmental period. 
and it was good for us. We had to learn to survive in the woods, on grassland, on open savanna. And for example, three million years ago, the African climate dried out. That drying caused the trees to be replaced by grassland. And at the same time, we see Australopithecus afarensis, also known as Lucy. And it's an upright walking ancient hominin, which is part of our human group. Uh, it's a broader designation, but it's part of the same group. And it freed the hands for tool use of Lucy. And that expanded the terrain that we could traverse and climb. So together, with tool use and the ability to move from place to place, that's a good thing. It allowed Australopithecus to create food and mine for resources, not like, you know, StarCraft style, but still like get resources. And we moved from climbing to walking. As trees were being pushed out by climate change, sidebar, this happened over a long period of time. Like it wasn't, again, just one Lucy out there being like, huh, it looks like I can take this stone and I can use it to smash on that stone and I can do a thing. No, instead, it actually happened over tens of thousands of years, many, many, many generations. That's why adaptation and evolution take place. It's a big deal. So, reminder, climate change that we have now happened in 100 years. We're not adapting to that. It's way too fast. It is unheard of in geologic time. Okay, but, you know, except by asteroid impacts and stuff. So anyway, back to Lucy. Larger brains, complex tool use, all of that correlated with ancient gradual climate change. It was actually a good thing. More research is needed to know for sure exactly how and what happened, but of course, we're limited by the technology we have in this moment and by the resources that we can bring to bear in terms of geologic and ice cores and all sorts of other things. Another example of other adaptations to our planet's crazy climate that didn't succeed, for example, spring, in modern day, has shifted 1.7 days earlier since the 1950s, not since the 1050s, 1950s. A 2011 study found that animals that were used to specific temperatures are moving north to higher altitudes because it's getting warmer further south. And again, they aren't like, ah, it's a little hot. They are instinctual. So they're responding as things happen. Humans are somewhat protected from this. We're wrapped in our technology. And by technology, I don't necessarily mean Bluetooths. I mean like houses and heating, fire, clothing. We are wrapped in this technology and we are sort of, if I can you know, be a little editorial, self-deluding. The temperature shifts like these in history that we evolved to deal with happened over millions of years, not decades, not a single human's life. And animals will adapt or die, and most are doing the latter because adaptation is super resource expensive and requires lots of generations, and things that don't breed very fast are just gonna die maybe forever, because you have to spread your genes and adaptations to others for a whole population to adapt together over thousands of years. Humans, however, cannot do that today without birthing basically replacements for everyone with new genes. That's tough. Warmer climates mean more insects from the tropics into temperate climates. For example, mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes carry diseases like malaria and West Nile and Zika that could cause more illnesses and more death. And then nature would select from those people who gets to survive. And that's how human evolution could continue under climate change today. It happens just like it did in the past. But instead of thousands of people whittling it down to what we would call an endangered species today of maybe 10,000 pairs or 10,000 people, we're looking at seven billion, eight billion people that are gonna get whittled down until they adapt. That's not awesome. And if there's so much illness, people don't get to breed first. But that doesn't mean we haven't adapted in the modern day to take care of that. For example, sickle cell anemia and thalassemia are disorders of the blood. People with those disorders don't get malaria as easily. That's an adaptation. Perhaps if malaria or mosquitoes in general start to spread further and further, people with sickle cell anemia will be more likely to survive and have an advantage over others. And perhaps over time, we'll adapt to sugar and fat-based diets the way that we adapt to milk and cheese diets thousands of years ago. But again, lots of people have to die in order for us to do that. 
Another example, global warming means migration. We're gonna to have to move as storms ravage coasts and deltas, rivers and seas, and that migration will cause more of a mixing of people, which I'm sure will cause more death and strife today, but over hundreds or thousands of years could change us all, maybe for the better. That is all adaptation is change over time of a whole population, right? Whether adaptation is good or bad depends on that survivorship bias that we talked about earlier. Oceans and mountains no longer separate us for hundreds of generations. We're separated by ourselves, by our societies, by our cultures, and by our political boundaries that we have built. We can move anywhere on the planet in a matter of hours. So as gene pools coalesce, gene flow happens. Gene flow is when combinations of genes from varying gene pools mix, and that makes humans that no one has yet seen, which also means that humans today are still evolving. While I'm not a big subscriber to the world of X-Men in, I, I love the comics, but having it happen in real life, I don't think we're going to end up popping out mutants that can do really cool things, but little mutations could spread if society allows it. So for example, this is one I'm just making up now. If ADHD turns out to be an advantage and not a disadvantage in a digitally connected, hyper, you know, active world where you have to figure out what's happening in, in 10 different places at once, that could potentially be an advantage. Assuming a lot of things, of course. And that might spread throughout society where people with ADHD do better, get better jobs, can breed better, or have a better chance of breeding. You never know. For, we gotta fast forward hundreds of years to find out. But there are studies of stuff like this. A Stanford study of 3,000 genomes looked at possible evolution over the last 2,000 years, and they found some mutations that actually were really cool, like blonde hair and blue eyes. The blonde hair, blue eyed mutation happened fairly recently. And the advantage of that is more vitamin D in cloudier places like Northern Europe or the United Kingdom. If you have blonde hair, blue eyes, and lighter skin, you'll get more vitamin D with less sunshine, which is sometimes advantageous. Another advantage that we've talked about already is the ability to digest milk. Both of those mutations spread rapidly. Another study of over 200,000 genomes found a gene related to nicotine addiction, and that gene was not selected for in Northern California, for example, but was in the UK where smoking was pretty common, pack a day habit. So evolution meant that we were seeing those genes more in the UK. People were surviving longer with this nicotine addiction, and we could see it in the genetics within the last 2,000 years, and in the case of tobacco, even more recently. Maybe not X-Men, again, but, you know, mutants, I guess? It's a lot more boring than comic books. <laughs> we have no idea how we will change due to global warming, climate change, climate shift, whatever you want to call it but we will have more CO2 in the air by 2100 than ever in the history of humankind. And I don't mean that like hyperbolically. I mean, four million years ago, when there were no Homo sapiens yet, we had not yet evolved. There were other ancient human groups, but not us. There was less CO2 in the air than is projected for 2100. Meaning humans less than a lifetime from now will be living in a world that no other human ever in the history of our species over millions of years has ever survived in, ever. I tend to be um, pretty optimistic in that I see the glass is half empty. <laughs> that may seem a contradiction, but what I mean by that is that I think Homo sapiens will survive in some form, but it depends on what we put into that glass to make it full. And I think that we have a lot of uh, ethical challenges, moral challenges, technological, environmental challenges, whereby we have to, you know, work together as humans are pretty good at doing, but in enlarging that circle from my own family to my own social group, to my own nation, to, to a global kind of thinking, because it's, it's something that's... Um, uh, occurring all over Earth. Here's a fun fact that you might enjoy. Statistically speaking, the words global warming are more powerful in terms of our paying attention than climate change. Climate change actually turns us off. It sounds boring. And it was designed to feel that way. Global warming gets your attention. But the phrase climate change was actually invented by policymakers to make the climate crisis sound wonky. And I'm sure you can guess which group made that one up. But since we're on the topic of global warming, what do you actually know about it? 
Like, what do you know? I know most of us have grown up hearing about the greenhouse effect, the CO2 blanket covering the earth and pollution and everything, but do you know how it all comes together? How we know what's happening? How the climate actually changes and what that is gonna do to the planet? Because if you don't, Curiosity Stream has some amazing documentaries to help wrap our little learning brains around a topic as convoluted and confusing as global warming can be. But if that's not your thing, you could watch docs about ancient history or the internet featuring Bay Derek Muller. Or if TV isn't your thing, you could pop over to Nebula and learn about the logistics of World War II or the secrets of the Great British Baking Show from one of the finalists. CS and Nebula together are excelente. There is so much to learn so much to watch, and so much we can do with all that knowledge. You can check out both in a bundle. It's an offer code that you can use. It's my name, Trace, curiositystream.com slash Trace, promo code Trace. Link is in the description. I'm not gonna spam you with it, because here's the deal. It's only 124 cents a month, and that 100-ish pennies support all the creators on Nebula, and you get a bunch of new curiosity quenchers on both Nebula and Curiosity Stream together. You get CS, you get Nebula for free, and it's both awesome. Thanks for considering it. Now, genetic adaptation is one way to cope with climate instability. It, another way might be technological adaptation. But what is the difference? Like really, what is the difference? Can one inform the other? What are humans gonna look like in say 100 years? How about 1,000, 10,000? Will we evolve? Will global warming change us? Dr. John Stewart, one of the researchers studying uncertainty says, quote, Humans are able to cope with lots of different things, and something in evolution must have made that so. Does this mean that we humans will change with our planet? Maybe. Maybe we'll adapt in other ways, like technologically. Let's talk about it next time. I am Trace. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you so much for subscribing if you have. If you haven't, just click the little button. Super easy. I would really appreciate it. Come find me over on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, anywhere at Trace Dominguez. And of course, if you have ideas for future episodes, there's a link down in the description. You can send them right to me. Thanks again, humans. I'm Trace, and I will see you in the future. Hopefully.